Evelyn to Philip, December 23rd, 1942, three exact months, 7.40 p.m. My sweet Phil, it's three months since you went away and lots has happened since then. I'm wondering how much longer you'll be away. I'm so tired this evening. I feel I shall drop from sheer exhaustion. I cleaned the living room, but you should have seen it. Cobwebs a half inch thick dangled from the ceiling, and there was a coat of dust a half inch thick. No kidding. The sweeper could hardly pick it up. Overall, when I changed the position of the slats of the Venetian blinds, I was greeted by such an onslaught of dust that I coughed and sneezed. No wonder everyone in this house is suffering with colds. The place was cleaned by me on November 25th, four Wednesdays ago, and this is the first cleaning in four weeks, except the general cleaning mom did while I was in the hospital. So use your imagination. I also cleaned our room, made formula, bathed, page two, I mean sponged Adele, made supper, and ran up and down the stairs a hundred times or more, etc., etc. A rather hectic day, to say the least. We didn't get mail till 5 p.m., and then I received your very sweet Monday letter. What happened on Sunday? Didn't you write that day? About OCS, I think we'll have I think we'll save that for when you come home. I have too many questions to put to you. And thanks for the lovely compliments about my picture and knees, honey. It's very thoughtful and sweet of you. I finally managed to get a few details concerning Jack's first physical. It seems he was supposed to go for it on December 9th, but due to the delay of mail, Anne didn't receive the card till December 10th. She called the board and explained, and since Lenny had notified the board of Jack's Philadelphia address when he came here, she told them to con contact him in Philadelphia, thereby delaying the exam. He hasn't received any mail from the board up till now. Of course, sweetheart, I'll let you know when anything pops. It was sunny and not very cold today. So I turned off the heat, opened all windows and doors, and gave the house a page three, good airing. Are you receiving your record daily? If you are, you'll notice that they intend to raise the price of household gas again, some 15 or 20 percent. The stinkers, pardon my French. I received a package from Strawbridge and Clothier today. It was a peach tailored slip with the top cut to mold the breasts as a bra does, of very fine quality, a gift from Tante Chouge. It's a very lovely one and fits perfectly. Mom is still in bed and her throat is practically healed. She intends to get up and about tomorrow, but we'll see how she feels tomorrow. I want to buy her a nice Christmas gift, as the kids already gave her the robe slippers and nighty. She needs a new handbag, and a good woolen scarf and glove set would be very useful and warm. I want to shop for it myself, and since I won't be able to get it in time for Christmas, I may let it go till you come home. If I go out before that time, I'll get the two items I mentioned. Page 4. Or maybe I'll learn of something else she needs more important. Did you receive the packages yet? Adele is fine and gets hungrier and hungrier. Her nose seems better, but has a tendency to become more clogged at night. My mom comes in every night and does my wash. She hasn't been sleeping here for the past week or so. At the present moment, darling mine, Jack, Gloria, Mom, and Adele are sleeping. Harry is working, and I am sitting. Yes, sweet, I can sit now. It only hurts a bit. On the studio couch, writing to you. It's so quiet you could hear a pin drop. I'm alone with you and my thoughts of you, my precious Phil. 
and they're very pleasing thoughts indeed. I'm also gazing at the two pictures of you proudly displayed on the mantle. I'm kissing you, sweet baby. I'm hugging you. I'm rumpling your soft hair. I'm kissing the back of your neck on that particular spot that sends the chills up your spine. And I'm holding you in, and my thoughts of you ah, so tightly. Baby mine, I adore you and all that you stand for. Three weeks from tonight, we'll be together once more. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Now and forevermore, your Evie. Philip to Evelyn, Wednesday, De December 23rd, 610 p.m. I was robbed, no insignia. Dearest darling, what a day. After an hour of drilling this morning, our wacky sergeant, you know the one, decided to clean up the barracks and police the area around it. That is, he decided to have it done. As luck would have it, I got the dirtiest, most backbreaking job of the lot. This consisted of getting under the barracks, which is a job in itself since there was only about two feet clearance, and tossing out all the debris that had collected in the six months since the barracks was built. What a job! I was forced to crawl around in mud and small stones on all fours. I was plenty burned up at what seemed a thoroughly unnecessary task, and I couldn't refrain from asking the great I am what the idea was. Fire hazard, he says, and I could have spit in his eye at that moment, for as I pointed out to him, everything that could possibly burn was soaked through and could never get dry enough in that damp place to burn. He merely shrugged, so I gave it up as a bad job and carried out his orders, although with poor grace. As if this weren't enough, he found another impossible job for us. The walk in front of our barracks happens to be the lowest spot in a hundred... Page two, yards in any direction. Naturally, all the water from the melted snow, it's warm again, settles in this place. But this didn't suit our finicky sergeant, so he decided we were to drain it off. His bright idea was to scoop the water up in buckets, carry it through the barracks, and dump it in the ditch in front of the building. A few of us realized right off the bat that this was a silly proposition because at that rate we'd be a week getting rid of enough water to even make an impression. Nor did we make any bones about it, but you could get more satisfaction from a stone wall than you can from the sergeant, who is fully as dumb as he is stubborn and conceited, if that's possible. After an hour of backbreaking labor by three or four of us, even the sergeant recognized the fact that the pool was filling as fast as we were trying to empty it. Finally, he got the brilliant idea of digging a ditch and allowing the water to drain off itself. This was the logical thing, of course, but even this would have been twice the work that was necessary had I not pointed out to him that he wanted to dig the trench through ground that sloped downhill. Any dope knows that water will flow downhill. That is why the sergeant agreed to dig only up to that point. After some tough digging because of the frozen ground, we finally completed the job. Then I turned my efforts to the much more necessary task, page three, of washing the window. In the meantime, out of a clear blue sky, a truck drove up and delivered a quantity of wooden beds with springs, which caused a furor in barracks. We had just about finished cleaning up and everything was spick and span when Zowie, there was bedlam, get it? In a twinkling, the joint took on the aspects of a madhouse, a dirty one. There were cartons and springs and boards everywhere, and bedding and the cots we had been using. One fellow who had gone to the, PA, the PX after getting all cleaned up 
walked in, took one look, and walked right out again, thinking he had stumbled into the wrong building. Again, after much to do, we were cleaned up once more, all the beds having been set up and lined up, when one misinformed twerp came in to announce that the beds were to be set up double-decker fashion. He must have noticed the homicidal gleam in our eyes because he beat a hasty retreat, only to return with the lieutenant. The officer looked about and decided there was no need to double up, after which we sighed a great sigh of relief and got busy with the business of relaxing after the hardest day in many a moon. The End You're delightful and, oh, you name it, amazingly frank, darling, Su daring, suggestive letter of the 20th arrived this morning. I've read it at least half a dozen times over because of its oddly thrilling qualities. Your apprehension as to your ability to satisfy us on the occasion, page four, of my coming home, even sooner than you think, is fully justified because I'm going to eat you alive when I get to you, baby. Seriously, though, sweetness, I can't even begin to imagine how anything could satisfy me more than simply holding your loveliness close to me. Never fear, honey. Whatever happens, it will be heavenly, if only because it's us, together again. I hope, though, that you'll be able to enjoy us to the fullest extent. For this reason. Hold your breath now. I'll be home January 6th. So anxious am I to get home, baby, that when one of the fellows offered to trade furlough dates, moving me up a full week, I jumped at the chance. So you can imagine my disappointment when your letter arrived with its doubts as to whether you'll be, quote, ready, unquote, to, quote, receive unquote me, on, ja on January 13th. Now, I'm in a quandary. Don't get me wrong. If it were up to me, I'd come tomorrow. But you seem to attach so much importance to your readiness that I'm wondering if I shouldn't set the furlough back to the 20th, which I doubt is possible, or even the 27th, which I know is possible. However, I'll get your preference direct when I talk to you Saturday, Chippy. If you'd rather I wait until the 27th, you can tell me then. Yeah, you can tell me then. Just in case you don't get it, allow me to inform you, my dear wife, that I shall be seeing you, among other things, not January 27th, nor the 20th, but January 6th. You can't say I didn't warn you, woman, so you better be ready. Is he kidding? I love you, Ev. Now do you get it? Phil.